So last but not least, to close out CVI 2017, uh, Dr. Gagan Singh. Close it out, Gagan. Take us home. All right, everybody, I'll, I'll uh, hopefully try to get everybody on their, on their way and on the plane home soon, although Denver has been a great, great venue. So I want to thank Paul and, and all the organizers again once more. So, you know, a couple of months ago when I got the email, uh, can you know, talk about complex transeptal puncture, you know, I was kind of like Matt, uh, who was just scratching, trying to find something, and then fortunately a couple of weeks ago this case happened. Now, the other interesting thing is the definition of complex transeptal puncture has changed. Um, I think over the last five years of folks doing left-sided structural interventions has just exploded. Prior to that, anybody doing a transeptal thought, just a transeptal period was complex. Um, but you know, I think with the, with the support from the, from the industry, such as Boston Abbott, some really good transeptal courses that I've had the opportunity to work with Paul and Seibel on, I think it's really demystified the process of transeptal puncture. Today I saw beautiful overlay images by John Carroll where you actually saw the entire 3D transeptum uh, on the fluoro image at the same time. And it was just, I think it's going to really, again, make it easier. But every once in a while, you will come across a transeptal, a complex transeptal case. So, so I think it'll be fun to talk about it. Um, so this was an uh, elderly female. She had paroxysmal AFib, some, some cardiovascular comorbidities. She originally got re referred for TAVR. It turned out her, her, uh, she had a full TAVR workup, but really she ended up having moderate to severe aortic valve stenosis only. Uh, but she was Jehovah's Witness. Uh, she had a prior IVC filter replacement place. Uh, she had a pacemaker, and, and she really wasn't that tall for her weight. Uh, if anything, she said over the last several years she had lost some height. She's on systemic anticoagulation, but more importantly, um, she suffered a pretty a significant bleed recently, and now referred for uh, left atrial appendage occlusion. So, so we get mid-femoral venous axis. We're bringing her in for a, a Watchman procedure, and uh, here's a wire going through her AVC filter. And the, the big secret, if you don't know about it, but filter doesn't really filter anything, even your J wire. <laughs> so. Kind of your J wire goes up uh, pretty nicely through the through the IVC filter, and here's your SL1 catheter um, or our SL1 sheath. Now it's interesting. I don't know if you this is the initial tip off that we're going to be dealing with a lot of tortuosity. As you see the SL1 foreshortening a little bit as it kind of goes over that pelvic brim. So if you see that ever on fluoro, immediately you should alert yourself to the fact that you're going to be dealing with a lot of iliofemoral tortuosity. So we kind of did that. Normally we don't fluoro our, our sheets going up, but if there's an IVC filter, we generally do watch everything going up through there. So once we get everything up there, there's a, I'm going to use my pointer here. So there's the, the this is actually the, the pacemaker lead coming in and out of screen here, but this is the tip of the needle. I mean, this is about the, as far as we could really get to engage the, the fossa. Just couldn't, had no torque control on it whatsoever. Um, and so what we decided to do now is go ahead and upsize and, and bring a big sheath. And again, we got a lot of resistance in this area here, we watched our, our cook sheath go up and we we're gonna kind of have the entire SL1 system go through there and see if we could better engage the fossa this way. So we get it in there and this is again 3D reconstruction from Tom Smith who's just, uh, who's absolutely awesome at, at imaging. Here's uh, uh, kind of looking down at the mitral valve. Here's the left atrial appendage os here and, and here's the tip of my, my SL1 with a needle and I just can't clock it posterior for the life of me. I just cannot get it to go posterior at all. Uh, so we thought, okay, well, let's go ahead and, and upsize to a 16 French cook sheath. So maybe get some more space in there and that may help. And we actually bring in an, an Agilis, um, uh, medium curl sheath, as, as Andrew was talking about earlier. Now, I heard uh, Paul say earlier that his institution uh, pays $1,100 for his, his uh, medium curl sheath. I need to find your supplier because we get charged uh, close to $2,400. And maybe that's retail and, and we get reimbursements or whatnot. But, but anyway, so that's, taxes. yeah, <laughs> so we, uh, uh, so we took out the medium curl gel sheath and, and just nonchalantly immediately taking the needle back in and putting it in. And all of a sudden the needle, the needle's hubbed and the needle tip just comes out right to there. And then at that moment, that light bulb goes off again. And again, we talk about this in transeptal courses, you actually need the longer needle. So uh, the, uh, with the Agilis sheets, you actually need the 98 cm long needle, either the BRK or the Bayless. And this horse would turn around look in the back shelf and there's the 98 centimeter needle is nowhere to be found. So we have one used supposedly in the cath lab somewhere and that one has not been used in five years and we can't find it anywhere. So, so then we got to start thinking outside of the box a little bit, try to figure out how we're going to approach this. So it took a back end of an 035 wire and started pushing against the interatrial septum and it got a little uncomfortable there for a second and, and I had to, to pray to the gods uh, that nothing would happen to this Jehovah's Witness lady who was just a sweetheart. Uh, fortunately, uh, or fortunately, unfortunately, nothing happened wrong, but unfortunately, the, the back end of the wire would not cross. 
So then, uh, you know, I hear Seibel always talking about how he works at a very uh, poor community hospital in Beverly Hills, and he, he likes to use electric cautery. So basically, we took the electric cautery out, and it turns out you cannot electric cauterize an 035 wire. And I did not know that. Uh, but uh, so I learned that on the spot. We did get an 014 wire across. This is actually incorrect. We, we got an 014 wire across, but 014 wire clearly didn't have enough support to get everything over. Uh, we tried advancing a balloon to see if over the 014 wire, but again, everything just kept prolapsing back into the RA. So that didn't clearly work. So then took a V18 control wire and actually got a V18 control wire in there and then cauterized that, and that seemed to work really well. So now we got our, our wire across there, but again, there wasn't enough support to bring everything over. So we uh, ballooned it, got an 018 system, got a four millimeter balloon, uh, ballooned it, and then ultimately uh, used some peripheral quick cross catheter, an 035 quick cross catheter, and brought that all the way up into the left upper pulmonary vein, took that 018 wire out and advanced our standard um, stiff wire, supportive uh, amplat super stiff wire uh, with a 7CM tip up there. And then, so this is, uh, you can immediately see, you know, the entire septum was just oriented very differently just because the way her IVC is oriented according to her, uh, her inner atrial septum. We got our pigtail catheter up, and, and, and the actual left atrial appendage uh, didn't look that unfavorable for closure. So we ultimately were able to, um, to deploy a, uh, a plug in there. And, you know, I mentioned earlier she was referred for TAVR initially, and, and so she did have C, a CT TAVR that was done, and then I kind of went back after the case to review it. And this is her, her arterial system, but again, her venous system follows suit. It takes a, basically a, a sharp left bend and then another sharp right bend, and then her entire IVC is kind of pulled away from her heart. So it made the, the transeptal puncture there uh, a little challenging, especially using the standard, standard tools that you have. So, you know, there, the venous axis was at 12.03 p.m. and initial appendix. So it took us about an hour and 20 minutes to, to actually do the transeptal puncture. The actual uh, um, left atrial appendage closure didn't take more than 10, 14, 10, 14 minutes. Uh, you know, blood loss was minimal, thank God. Uh, and 34 minutes for a, a watchman case is long. Uh, you know, there were some concerning moments, uh, but, uh, you know, fortunately we got through and then, you know, the patient left the lab unharmed and, and you know, that's, that's what you really care about. So, so I think you have to, so in terms of where, where do complex transeptal cases come in now, I think for the most part with the amount of education information that's out there now in practice, you know, transeptal puncture should really just be another tool set that all interventional cardiologists have. Your, your standard transeptal should not be complex, but you got to watch out for these patients who have substantial iliofemoral tortuosity because all your sheets and needles just want to be pulled away. And you can add as much bend you want to the needle, the secondary bend, you still can't reach it. IVC filters, like I said, don't really filter anything, but just watch your wires and catheters going through. You got to be systematic. And then again, these really severe iliofemoral, the tortuous system, uh, uh, systems you might want to save for some of your later cases, especially when you first start doing them. So thank you.